So welcome everyone to our online meetup for May. And yeah, this is Eradicate Reciprocal Dependencies to Unleash Agility. And I'd like to welcome Dennis Sunny, who's joining us from Portugal. Is that right, Dennis? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So far I'm like... here. So yeah. So far because I'm still in the uh, attempt of uh, getting into Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my uh, the country of my dreams, if you want, but did not make it so far, hopefully in the future. So I'm really pleased to be here and uh, see everybody. Um, so hopefully maybe in uh, some future we will uh, even work together, maybe. Uh, but uh, today um, the session is about this uh, topic, eradicating reciprocal interdependencies to unleash agility. Um, Rowan, do you mind if I'm just starting right away? Go for it, Dennis, other than I was just going to say, everyone, welcome, Dennis. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So um, maybe as soon as you uh, started with me, I will introduce myself quite briefly. Um, yeah, I'm Dennis Sunny, and uh, um, my focus is on the holistic organizational design for strategic agility. In the um, discussion that we have, I believe uh, that was Michael probably in the recent uh, 10, 10 minutes, uh, he mentioned teams and uh, everyone is uh, quite uh, um, a lot speaking about teams. Uh, I'm focusing on the holistic organizational design, which is not just teams, this is the whole organization and not only about the organizational structures, processes, but all the aspects involved. Um, I'm a trainer and consultant. Um, and uh, right now, my main focus uh, in terms of the public courses uh, is on the Designing Agile Organizations course that I'm giving, and uh, I'm coming visit uh, uh, in August uh, to Sydney. Um, so I'm also, yes, of course, I have a bunch of different badges. I don't know if you care about the, those and you have any questions, we can catch up uh, later on. Uh, relevant to this discussion, as soon as we are speaking about agility, I years ago I was uh, nominated this PSM uh, the third uh, badge. In my very past, I was a project manager, head of project management office. It was 15 years ago. I started my career as a developer in software development, I mean, uh, and uh, recent, probably five to 10 years, I'm focusing on consulting various uh, companies, um, starting from small startups up to really gigantic corporations. Here I put just uh, several of the most well-known uh, brands. Uh, mo most likely you, you know all of those. Um, and uh, yeah, briefly, this is it about me. I suggest if you have, again, if you have any questions, we will have a Q&A session in the, in the end. So you can ask those questions, all right? Okay, okay. So by the way, the about questions. Um, in uh, almost always when I have uh, these kind of uh, webinars uh, uh, or just discussions, I have a lot of questions from participants and I ask you guys, please, uh, your questions are very important. Please put them into the chat. And I will ask Rowan to, Rowan, please monitor <laughs> the, the chat. So if you discover that something might uh, need answering right away, tell me, okay? And I will see because I know the uh, presentation that I'm giving this session and uh, maybe I will answer right away. Maybe I will tell you that, hey guys, just a couple of sec, uh, some later slide will give you the answer probably, or maybe I will ask you to wait until the Q&A, okay? So you have questions, put them into the chat. Uh, important um, to say, and this is for me very important because I'm always keen to uh, give some, bring value to people, not just speak and <laughs> sell something. Yes, of course, I'm consultant, but I work for, uh, for pleasure of seeing how people really get something valuable for them from um, what I'm uh, teaching them on uh, what, what I uh, give consultancy about. So important to note here that this problem that we are discussing today, these reciprocal interdependencies, that is just one little uh, symptom of numerous deeply rooted dysfunctions in organizations. So I advise against considering this topic in the isolation. Of course, it's important to understand this topic, but when you come to your organizations, I do not really suggest you um, think about this in the isolation from all other aspects. What I really suggest is the holistic and systemic approach to designing 
uh, AGL organizations. Holistic, this is the very important. What is this about? Well, uh, five minutes in the end, you will see uh, some couple of slides I will give just to um, uh, like a glimpse about uh, uh, what this is, uh, the designing agile organizations about, okay? Now, the agenda. Um, first, we will just um, be, get on the same page about the problem that we are discussing. Then, uh, what are the most impactful types of dependencies? Yes, of course, reciprocal dependencies. Then, how we can find those? Uh, how we can identify the most impactful out of those reciprocal ones. How can we eradicate them or at least minimize their impact? And uh, in the end, as I said, a uh, couple of uh, minutes, we will take to uh, look at the DAO uh, as a holistic organizational design for agility. And finally, the Q&A session. Okay. And by the way, please tell me right away if I'm speaking too quickly. Uh, and you you cannot follow, okay? Because th this is my way of uh, delivering information. I believe that we have quite seasoned uh, agilists here, so maybe maybe uh, it will work for you, and uh, it's not not that that difficult. But otherwise, tell me, please. What is the problem? So the context uh, for this session is that the speed and benefit cost ratio of business value delivery are critical. Um, the whole idea of the organizational design is quite often misunderstood and people just, ah, we need to improve here, there, there, there. What are we optimizing for? So in the context of this session, we will just keep in mind uh, that we believe that speed and benefit cost ratio of business value delivery are critical. Because otherwise, if this is not critical, uh, all these dependencies, they don't make any sense for us, okay? And again, what is the business value? Just again, to be on the same page, because um, some, for instance, some frameworks, they believe that there are different types of value. What I'm speaking about here is the business value delivery, meaning that it requires business value to be created. <laughs> and uh, uh, for instance, by delivering new features to customers and learning from their feedback. Well, on the opposite delivery, this is not the, the, what we are focusing on in this session. Delivery can be whatever. So it, it can be just a task delivered, uh, maybe even without any value. Okay. So we focus exactly on the business value delivery. Um, what I'm going to explain these examples throughout the whole this session, this can happen or can be found in, at any level of the organization. This is very important to uh, really get on, this pay, uh, on the same page about this. So it can happen between individuals within one team or one group or one startup, if you want. It can happen between teams, like maybe between uh, two people inside different teams, for example. It can happen between departments and even between companies. And uh, I will use just one simple, this uh, colorful uh, icon. Uh, but when you see this icon, please uh, keep in mind that it can be a, an individual, a team, a department, or even a company, OK? Now, let's go into this. So uh, we start with simplified example. And uh, uh, this example is about some customer-centric item. Uh, these guys are responsible for this item delivery from the initial analysis. Yeah, this is probably something from the software development because this is the predominantly my uh, field of um, interest and uh, where I am specializing. But it can be any other type of uh, organization uh, trying to become agile. So responsible for the item delivery from the initial analysis up to releasing to customers and ultimately, yeah, hopefully learning something from that um, releasing. So we will try to learn about um, how this work uh, is done throughout the whole period, uh, which can be uh, quantified as a lead time. Because it starts from the discovery of the business opportunity, and it's like, hey, hey guys, we have this opportunity, let's explore it, right? And it ends when the actual value, the customer value is created, and uh, some guys are happy about that. Those customers, they are willing to pay for it. Yeah. But before, we just need to appreciate the fact that most likely these guys, they have not just one this task. They have a, have a pipeline. So they have a queue, which can be visible or invisible, task queue. 
Um, if these guys uh, implement something like Scrum, for example, then maybe this is a backlog, right? So let's just take this into account. Uh, when the task is prioritized, what it means, it enters this queue. Then what happens? It waits for some time while other tasks are tackled, and uh, this is the time to tackle this item, right? So you see that on this uh, scale of the lead time, we put this um, uh, waiting time. This is how I will depict uh, different types of time uh, that takes uh, throughout the whole this process. Okay, now this is the work time because guys are doing something about this item. Then this item, what? Well, maybe that was um, initial, initial analysis, right? Then now they have a question and this question need to be answered. Well, ideally, of course, we expect that people just speak to each other right away without any delay, et cetera. But of course, quite often it happens that those people who need to answer this question, they are not that much, well, it's, it's just hard for them to answer right away because of different reasons. Then this question, what it goes in a sort of email, for example, or a message, or even we call them and they say, well, give me some time, I will answer later. So those people, again, that can be another person or another team, department, company, something outside of these responsible people. Now, what it means? It means that it takes time again, waiting time, until these guys, they respond. Okay, hopefully they do some work to respond and uh, it returns back to the pipeline of the responsible people. Now, of course, these people are already busy with some other tasks. They need to finish that. In other waiting time, some work again done, maybe further analysis and another question. This time, just imagine that this time it requires some uh, meeting that cannot happen right away again. It should be scheduled. So there is some time of waiting till this meeting. This meeting happens and again, this repeats, right? Now, the point is, well, guys need some subtask to be executed. So this subtask, again, it now reaches the pipeline of uh, those other guys. Yeah, I hope that you follow right now because I'm quite exhilarating, right? So the point, the whole point is that those guys, they have some work to be done. They cannot take it, uh, tackle it right away. Oh, of course, <laughs> there's this waiting time added. And finally, the work is done on their side. It returns back to the pipeline of the responsible people. A little bit of waiting time because those guys were busy. Finally, what happens? They are happy to deliver this item to the happy customers. Yay, we did it. Now, important to note that this, this is really a simplified example, at least based on my experience with multiple <laughs> companies in different, different industries. So normally, uh, much more of such interactions happen. All right, emails, which cannot be answered right away, scheduled meetings, and even subtasks. It happens, it, it's ubiquitous. And the number of this iteration is often unpredictable. Now let's just group all the work uh, elements or work episodes together and waiting time. And on this scale or, or out of this lead time, you can discover that the work time of course takes a little part while uh, the waiting time is huge. If we look at these, um, counterparties, these people who were involved into this, there are some, uh, you can say that they belong to different organizational elements. So for example, they can work in different roles or teams or departments. There are some organizational boundaries. So between these people, there's the organizational distance. Why I'm saying this? Because this is quite important to appreciate and recognize that from the perspective of the business impact of all different dependencies, if you look at how the organizational distance influences or impacts that, you will discover that with the increase of the organizational distance, your waiting time dramatically raises. So this is, I'm right now not speaking about reciprocal interdependencies, by the way, <laughs> I'm speaking in general. Yeah, so for some type of dependencies, these, um, <clears throat> this race will be less dramatic, but for others will be quite significant. All right, so I hope that you follow so far, okay? Now, if waiting time increases, then respectively your speed of value delivery drops down. Just keep in mind this for now. 
Now, real life example. I just took this uh, from one of my uh, recent clients. Uh, they had this web app team. So this is the software development. They have the team who was responsible for the web application. What they had, they had this <clears throat> team backlog that is quite common. But what they also had, this was not visualized anyhow. They had analysts. They 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 called these people just developers. But the matter of fact, they worked in different capacities. Uh, some people did analysis solely analysis. Some people did uh, uh, development, and others did testing or quality assurance. De facto, these people um, tackled uh, their tasks in some order. So these cues were not formal. They were not formalized anyhow, not visualized, but they still existed, like invisible cues. And between these people, of course, you can expect that there was a lot of interdependencies. Well, I would say that continuously they interacted, they had to interact. So this team quite often had some questions, small requests or subtasks to a bunch of other teams. So uh, what I'm saying is that, uh, of course, there is some um, uh, organizational distance. At least because these different teams, they had different focus areas and probably a little bit different goals, right? But inside these teams, well, uh, essentially the same organization happened. So they had different roles inside, it then interacted inside them. On the other hand, the uh, web app team also quite often had questions and small requests to other departments. Right. So in this case, that was the business management, marketing and uh, support. So the people in those departments, they quite often did not take and just do whatever was needed, like answering the equations of this web app team right away. Why? Because they had some other work to be done. They had visible or invisible cues, too. Now I'm coming to the consequences of dependencies uh, for business value delivery. First of all, this is about the cost of work, which is quite often just really not, not recognized. If, you, uh, if we normally imagine what is the cost of work, and we imagine like this uh, thick, not that thick <laughs> piece of work, right? Then when we imagine, we do not really take into account any rework, any coordination overhead or switching costs, for example. But the reality is this. So I personally, I did... Uh, uh, um, sort of uh, calculations in uh, some of my uh, clients where I had enough time and, <laughs> and effort to spend on this. So my personal calculations uh, gave this two or seven times. Um, this is uh, how much is the difference between the imaginary work and the real work that happens exactly because of having those various dependencies. So it comes from the coordination overhead, rework, for example, after clarifications, and switching cost. Well, to, from my perspective, the, these are the uh, most contributing uh, components of the cost of work. But this is not it only, uh, because uh, as you saw, the lead time is comprised of uh, work and huge waiting time. And uh, again, my personal observations tell me that from 95 to 99 and 5 percent of the lead time, this is the waiting time. Quite many managers, uh, they don't really recognize that there is a cost of this waiting time, which is, for example, coming from the cost of delay, yeah, missing business opportunities, regulatory, reputation risks, depending on the sort of the business you have. But also cost of undone work maintenance. In software development, that would be code, uh, code merge conflicts uh, with uh, respective quality issues. You can look at this as um, cost of inventory and something like that. So all of these parts uh, are really under huge influence of those dependencies. I would say that should you have no dependencies, you would have something close to the imaginary, right? Um, this is, uh, I, I like this um, uh, analogy. Uh, I, I got this from one of my clients. The CEO has told me that he felt like this guy on this uh, snail, riding the snail, compared to the competitors who are running quickly. And uh, this is about the slow progress towards strategic business goals, ultimately. 
So what I'm trying to say, uh, when I start speaking to my clients, uh, normally middle management or closer to the top management, they do not really unfortunately recognize that this is not about teams, guys. <laughs> this is about the whole organization. This is throughout the whole organization and even crossing the boundaries of the organization. And this finally impacts the business result. Um, now, I would like to ask you just very quick, uh, did you observe similar consequences from various dependencies in your experience? Did you, did you see something like that? And I would like to uh, put just one uh, symbol in the chat right now. Plus, if yes, something similar or even worse, Minus if no, nothing like that. Zero, difficult to say. And a question mark if you do not really understand this, uh, the previous slide. And the previous slide is this. Yeah. So again, plus if yeah, quite similar. Minus no, nothing even close. Uh, difficult to say zero. And question if I do not understand. Let's see what we have here. Okay. We share quite a lot of in terms of observations. Nice, thank you. All right, all right. Let's give just ten seconds to others. Cool. Okay, I'm just wondering, um, uh, was it because of the snail? <laughs> <laughs> or was it because of these numbers? Okay, guys. But anyways, uh, I believe that uh, uh, Australia is not that much different um, because many people tell me that, oh, Australia is so much different. Our market is different. But the reality is the same. Uh, so I did this uh, questionnaire in my different discussions uh, in Europe, in US. <laughs> guys, the, the same happens always. Okay. Um, then next slide. Uh, what dependencies are the most impactful? Yes, you know what, what I'm leading to, uh, reciprocal dependencies. But we, before that, we need to understand what's the difference. I will try to make it as simple as possible. But there are uh, a lot of um, hidden um, uh, specifics. So if you're really curious about that, there are amazing books which are not the book that the course DAO course is built upon, but other books written 20 and 40 years ago. The space of dependencies is absolutely well uh, researched so far. But I don't know why Agile World does not speak about that so far. I don't know. So uh, first, let's look at these guys. Uh, a and B here represent uh, types of work. You can look at this as steps in the process, right? You can look at this as jobs or something like that. But important is that not just the people are different, but also the uh, process steps are different. So here we have two different units uh, responsible for steps A and B, and these steps can be done uh, independently. But they still have some resource sharing between them. And if these resources are scarce, then of course, you might discover that there's some uh, dependency, which is um, indirect in this case, right? So this kind of dependency is called pooled. By the way, the notation is uh, how we call this dependency is taken from 1967. It was uh, uh, offered uh, by uh, Thompson. And later, uh, I, I believe that in the modern uh, literature, this is the most common uh, use of uh, classifying different dependencies. So this is the pool dependency. Another quite common dependency type is uh, when uh, the output of the work of, um, the output of one step becomes the input of another step. And this is the sequential dependency. And now we come of course to uh, the most interesting one. What is this, Rowan? Okay. Ah, one half, okay, okay, yeah. I understand. Thank you. So now we come to the sequential dependency, um, to reciprocal dependency, uh, which is the output of, uh, output of one step becomes the input to the other step. And the output of that step becomes, again, the input to the first step. Important that in this case, at least the step A iterates. So the crucial part here is that these steps are uh, the step A is the same as it was uh, before. So quite often it happens that uh, there are many iterations necessary to really fulfill the step A or maybe step B too. 
So yeah, this is reciprocal. Uh, please keep in mind that there are uh, traps in uh, identifying these uh, reciprocal dependencies. Quite often, sequential may look like a reciprocal. For instance, if you assemble the box, then you pack goods in the box by different groups of people, and then it returns back to the first one to seal and ship. Well, on this diagram, it looks different to this one, for example. When develop, test, and this is like an iteration happening. This looks different, but if you look at it from the perspective of this representation, like uh, flowcharts sometimes represent just um, involved roles, right? Then they are the same. So it's crucial for us to distinguish what are the steps tackled at which of these um, transitions, yeah? So you see that there is a step C here, which is missing. Uh, on the second uh, uh, option. And in the second option, we have uh, at least the step A iterating. Yeah? So it repeats maybe numerous times. What we can say about this? So again, the sequential do not have uh, this um, phenomena that the reciprocal have, uh, because in the reciprocal, the inputs and outputs, they swap. In the first one, in the sequential, we have just another step to be tackled. Uh, speaking about reciprocal dependencies, uh, quite many scientists uh, or just explorers in the field of organizational design, they characterize it like this. Uh, high ambiguity and uncertainty uh, requires mutual adjustment, requires ad hoc coordination and iterative work. Familiar, right? Now, uh, I would like to also highlight that often reciprocal interdependencies are not easily visible or even hidden. Why? Because sometimes they are, have unpredictable nature. So we just know that, yeah, most likely it happens, but when exactly on which item this exactly dependency will work, we don't know for sure in advance. But most uh, likely it happens because uh, of the quite low effort this uh, email that you need to be answered and it blocks your work on this item, it does not take much time. It does not make to, uh, make it sense to include into any flowcharts or even speak about that. But the waiting time is huge and that matters. So now speaking about the coordination costs, according to some research, you can find it. Uh, if you want, we can share this link. But it uh, showed that reciprocal interdependencies are uh, twice as uh, much uh, costly, speaking of coordination cost, as other uh, uh, kinds of dependencies. Essentially, the uh, research showed that in the reciprocal interdependence scenarios, the participants spent almost 40% of their time on coordination work, 40% of time. I believe that I saw even worse examples, but yeah, that is that is the average. Now, uh, speaking of the business impact in general, not only coordination costs, but also including rework and switching costs, also including the cost of waiting time, reciprocal dependencies. That, that is the most damaging exactly because of the uh, waiting time, rework, uh, not only the coordination cost. Unfortunately, we did not have uh, found any uh, research, including other types of costs. So this is why I showed you all, only the diagram that we found about the coordination cost. Now, group work, and I will not ask you to go into some break room, breakout rooms, but just um, look at this and tell me um, what do you think about this. So we have these um, types of dependencies. Would you classify them as, well, of course, it can be different in different organizations and contexts, but in your uh, experience, where would you put them? Into reciprocal or sequential? For instance, the first one, software development and testing. Anyone? Any? It's reciprocal. Reciprocal. Okay. All right. Let's keep in mind that this probably is reciprocal. I would agree with you. In my experience, <laughs> this is the same. What about the goods production, some physical goods, and uh, delivery? Again, most sequential. likely. I, uh, sequential? I think so. Makes sense. Well, uh, at least it uh, resembles with uh, what I saw <laughs> in the production and delivery. 
software requirements collection and development that could be reciprocal because as they develop they uncover more requirements that need to be collected mm -hmm. it's a uh, more interactive or iterative work right what about coffee making by Johan and coffee making by Anna uh just using the same coffee machine cool it's just a shared resource Okay, so what kind of dependency that would be? Cooled or sequential. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, finally, front end development and back end development in software development. That could be that could be reciprocal because there could be changes in both that affect. Yeah. Uh, well. <laughs> based on my experience most likely but again it depends on the context right so uh, this exercise was just to uh, really ensure that we uh, slow down a little and we really discuss this so that we understand the difference all right now speaking about the business impact and organizational distance again because the previous slide like this was only about just some dependencies speaking about different types of dependencies this is uh the learning from the experience of mine and other trainers of uh, the designing agile organization course the longer is the distance organizational distance of the parties involved into these dependencies of course the bigger the business impact i mean ne negative business impact but reciprocal dependencies win here <laughs> negatively win right um so if you are curious, okay, Dennis, you're speaking so much about this business impact, what to do with that, right? So there's a guide in the Design Agile Organizations. It is called Contain Reciprocal Interdependencies. I put it right here because it's quite simple to explain based on this diagram. If you see, well, if you just look at this, you see that it grows with the growth of the organizational distance. You need to shorten the organizational distance. Redesign your organization to contain reciprocal interdependencies within the shortest possible organizational distance. And the more impactful the dependency, the shorter the organizational distance should be. Well, ideally, those are done by just the, the same person, right? No dependency. Or at least uh, within one single team. Or each team can do uh, and incorporate all these dependencies. So my point is this. Um, quite often, we are... Um, we are obsessed with everything happening around in the, in terms of what um, blocks us from becoming agile. But uh, there are specific aspects which make more harm. So if you at least start with the reciprocal dependencies, out of those, uh, identify the most impactful and tackle those, eradicate or at least minimize their impact, that will be a huge I cannot even uh, emphasize how huge uh, the impact on the business would be. So now, how to find reciprocal interdependencies? Um, flow diagrams. I will go quite quick because we spent uh, quite quite more uh, uh, quite much time on the previous slides. But uh, flow diagrams might be useful uh, if you are sure that these diagrams they represent something uh, really meaningful. I always suggest. Go see, of course, this practice, like uh, go and analyze it yourself, understand what happens. But uh, the flow flow charts, they uh, have some representation. Maybe if you uh, learn this and you uh, draw these diagrams, whatever, then probably it will help you to analyze. But essentially some task handovers is the most obvious case when you can see that there's this um, reciprocal dependency because it returns from the step A to step A back right it's obvious so it is connected to the handover of the task on the other hand there are many cases where the flow diagram is quite useless because uh, they do not represent something hidden for instance when there is a, a blocking subtask yeah and this blocking subtask is completely in 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 another jira project for example <laughs> or in other uh, flow chart or People don't just speak about that. They just don't think that this is important when you speak to them. So this happens quite often that this kind of dependency is just missing from the analysis. Also, 
even more frequently, I discover that blocking questions quite regularly happening. You, you can imagine there is a, a business analyst who works within the team and they uh, almost, well, more than in 30% of cases, they would ask the same people in, in other department, like marketing, for example, to clarify some stuff and they would have a lot of iteration and lose half of the lead time waiting those answers. That is important for the speed of uh, value delivery, but that is missing if you look just into these um, flow diagrams, right? Now, important to say that, of course, normally you can find uh, different kinds of these uh, uh, reciprocal dependencies, hidden, obvious, uh, in the real, the real process. Even important to say that sometimes you can discover that those are quite complex because from step A, it does not re return uh, to A uh, after B, but first it goes far beyond that and only then later returns to the step A. That is the hardest to, to, to find out because the chain is quite long, right? But still, this is a complex reciprocal dependency. So finally, uh, just to again, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, again, the group work just right away here. So we have this um, chart, okay? And it shows us that it starts from step A, then B, C, D, E, F, G, and finally the business value. So tell me, what do you think? Uh, where is here the reciprocal interdependency? Any ideas? G. Uh, yeah, interdependency between uh, some steps. So uh, G itself is just a step. So between G and what? G to D, I see. Ah, okay, now I'm, I'm looking into the chat. Guys, I just uh, missed it, sorry. So C, S, F, F, G, C, D, F, G, I assume, right? B, C, okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you for your answers. Now, look at this. The whole this chain is a complex reciprocal interdependency. Because if you look at D, for example, right? Its output through other steps returns as input, right? So this is very important to understand that uh, you can uh, break down every of these steps. And if you don't appreciate the fact that there are complex interdependencies like this, then by breaking down the step, you can lose the, <laughs> the, the reciprocal dependency because inside it, there's just a sequential dependency or maybe some pool dependency. So always keep in mind that uh, those uh, dangerous dependencies may be uh, complex. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. Now, last question for this session. Are there other reciprocal interdependencies? Any clues apart from these? This is the hardest question. I will not uh, keep you uh, unaware about this uh, for long. So the, the answer is this. <laughs> The flow diagrams, as I said, they're quite misleading because quite often they do not show you what happens at each of these steps. Uh, and they do not represent those ad hoc or low effort interactions quite often. So this is why I always suggest to just do the analysis, not just reading the diagrams. It does not help you. Go and see what actually happens inside uh, all of these steps, how people interact are they just, okay, if it happens only once, then maybe this is just one-time dependency. But if it happens regularly, then this is uh, harmful for, for the whole uh, uh, process. Yeah? Now, let's proceed. How to identify the most impactful reciprocal dependencies? So I will give just a couple of tools. Uh, one of those um, is the fundamental tool, which is not from the organizational design, that is from the design. That is from the axiomatic design by Nam Yu Such. I hope that I pronounced it correctly. But uh, that is 
an amazing book. I always suggest that I have uh, uh, one here. I don't know if you can see it. Is this thick? And this is for nerds, believe me. So it's quite hard to read and it involves uh, mathematics and et cetera. So this is quite scientific. So this uh, diagram just shows you um, the uh, dependencies between, in this case, between uh, different organizational units. You can see uh, the uh, highest level, marketing, customer support, compliance, technology, and also teams involved. And how you can see um, against this diagonal, uh, there are um, crossings, right? So it means that between those, there's the dependency onwards and backwards. So it's it's reciprocal. So uh, these, uh, I suggest always using this uh, type of um, tool, considering uh, some uh, frequency of happening. Because, well, again, if it happens once, maybe it does not make any sense to look at it. It's not impactful. But in this case, in this uh, client of mine, they um, had this threshold. Above 30% of cases they analyzed. They found out this. And if you look at the uh, traditional representation of the organizational chart, you, you will see that marketing together with these teams, they have frequent, complex, reciprocal interdependencies between them. So this is one of the tools. Another quite often used tools uh, is the heat map, so-called heat map, where you place, um, well, first of all, you need to know that you already have a lot of reciprocal interdependencies between um, functions or in this case, components like web, application, civil, et cetera, et cetera, even legal you can see here. So there are uh, reciprocal interdependencies, but well, you cannot address all of those right away. You need to uh, first focus on the most impactful, how you can do this. And uh, therefore, on the um, uh, the rules, they represent common examples of high-level features, for example, for the next half a year or looking uh, um, uh, retrospectively. Then you will identify how often these uh, reciprocal dependencies appear. So these, this, like where it hits most, uh, there the frequency is the highest and probably the highest impact. So this is another tool. Of course, these are just tools. You should you should use them uh, wisely and uh, uh, critically thinking about that. Then finally, guys, how you can minimize their impact of these dangerous reciprocal dependencies. Again, the uh, guide uh, tell us that contain reciprocal interdependencies. If you look at these different levels of, or different uh, distances, organizational distances, then you want to always try to, out of all of those uh, reciprocal interdependencies, find the most impactful and ensure that you can eradicate them by ensuring that one person can tackle these, uh, the most impactful uh, reciprocal interdependencies. Is it possible? Most likely not always, yeah? So if this is an impossible, then whenever it is impossible, try to organize cross-functional teams. Surprise, surprise, cross-functional teams. <laughs> try to organize cross-functional teams. But the point is how you are organize them, around what? Can you incorporate everything? Maybe not, but at least try to organize them in a way that they can um, cover all the reciprocal interdependencies, or at least the most impactful of, of those. And within teams, important, don't forget that within teams, you can find that people build their own queues. So uh, even within teams, it will still proceed uh, impacting because within teams, they have these reciprocal interdependencies. So try to eliminate impact by eradicating queues between team members. How to do this? Well, this is a separate story, of course. Now, if it is impossible, sometimes it's impossible to even ensure that you have teams covering fully all the reciprocal interdependencies, like that example with marketing, for example, right? Not always you can in include marketing people into the teams. Well, the, this is quite uh, in use well right now. So many, many companies adopt this approach, but still, what, what to do with that? Then we suggest organizing product groups containing teams together covering reciprocal interdependencies. So that inside the product groups, you encapsulate those reciprocal interdependencies. Again, if that is impossible, then at least focus on the most impactful ones. Well, I, I would doubt why this is impossible. Maybe just if you have dependencies of, on, on other companies. 
and also important that you need to develop the capabilities of people inside the product group to be become more and more capable of uh, addressing more and more reciprocal interdependencies within the teams and uh, by uh, team members. Finally, uh, you need to minimize impact of dependencies within the product group by making all priorities and work transparent, of course. Well, uh, guys, I believe that you understand this stuff, right? Because this is quite similar to Scrum, but um, not necessarily that this is Scrum. Uh, there are companies who are far away from uh, the traditional understanding of agile organizations, that, but they still need to be agile, and they adopt these approaches. So uh, using, for example, for using the um, uh, single uh, backlog, pursuing common outcome-based uh, outcome goals, etc. Therefore, we have a separate guideline. They organize into product groups. By the way, sometimes product groups are huge. And in this case, uh, there are uh, some approaches to deal with that, for instance, using the value areas inside. Um, important to note again, uh, if you remember one of the first uh, notes that I did in the very beginning was about uh, that the topic that we discuss here is one little stuff, don't isolate it. So with any solution that you come up with, speaking of structures or processes, ensure that respective adaptation of all other elements of organizational design happens. So there are, of course, other guidelines. And speaking of that, uh, just to outline what I'm speaking about, the organizational design includes, um, now I am taking the um, model, uh, the star model of Jay Galbraith, uh, structures, processes, rewards, and people. People meaning not the exact people, but the skills and mindsets that are hired with people, uh, developed with people. And finally, of course, the strategy or direction. So. According to the uh, idea of the organizational design, those must be consistent between them, work in synergy between them. But imagine that you want to become um, uh, adaptable, for example, yeah, for agility, adaptable and have a high speed of business value delivery. And maybe you have an idea that you need an agile framework, therefore, okay? Yeah, maybe, maybe it will work. But you have your wider organization, which has multiple reciprocal dependencies between teams and even other departments, something that we discussed in this session. But also you probably have conflicting goals of departments. You probably have separated product responsibility and development authority, annual budgeting, uh, conflicting uh, teams' loyalties to line and product management, and other, other aspects in the uh, wider organization. On the other hand, speaking of people and rewards, you might find that uh, your hiring is not consulted with teams, so they hire someone who does not fit the teams. The frequent changes in teams happen, the narrow skill-based careers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. On the side of rewards, you can discover that salaries, careers, and performance evaluation of people depend on individual achievement. Guys, what are we speaking here about? If uh, everything around the teams will drive them in the opposite direction, this agile framework, it will not help you anyhow <laughs> because culture will not change. Culture is a product of, of the structure, including all the organizational aspects. So the uh, idea of what we teach in the designing agile organizations is to ensure that these elements all are involved into the uh, intentional, holistic, and systemic organizational redesign. This is not about teams only. This is about the whole value generation, starting from the ideation, uh, discovery, and ending up with uh, creating the business value. So yes, of course, we have a scientific uh, foundation for that with axiomatic design and system thinking in the basis, a bunch of books. I can give you, again, the links. Amazing books, I always suggest. Well, depending, of course, on, on your capability of academic reading, that is quite hard for me personally sometimes. What I personally like about this approach, guys, I'm very skeptical. I have a very strong critical mind. I never bought anything that other people tell me. But what I like personally about this, this idea that we teach in the design agile organization, that we don't have any more decisions based on gut feeling or because it worked in other companies or something like that. Instead of that, uh, we prefer pure logic and transparent consistency with system optimization goals. So we look at the organization as a system, and this is quite uh, 
Like, you know, you need to prove what you're doing. Prove to yourself, make it uh, transparent to others. What is your logic? Why this happens? And we use systems thinking, therefore, of course. So, um, by the way, it's, it, this is not a framework. Yeah, I just put a couple of words about this. Definitely, this is not a framework. This is the approach to redesign your organization for agility. This is simply it. Yeah, we don't have time for, for this picture anymore, guys, uh, because time's over, right, Ron? But just a couple of words that the uh, approach starts from the strategy. We identify what is the strategic focus. We identify what are the challenges of the company or of the organization towards this strategy. We identify what are the missing capabilities and we address these gaps uh, through uh, the organizational design. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was awesome. By the way, a reminder, we have, uh, I'm coming to Sydney uh, this, uh, this year in August. So if you are interested in learning more, of course, uh, you're very welcome. Question answers. Yeah, thank you so much, Dennis. <laughs> uh, we have a hand raised, by the way. Um, Michael, yes. Michael, Rather yeah, please pick up. Pop it in the chat. Um, great, great um, presentation, by the way. It was uh, very insightful. Um, so I had an example a couple of years ago when working for an insurance company um, where every time they made a change to um, the front end of a website, um, it had to go through the legal department to ensure that their um, policies were, 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 were legal, right? A very important um, thing in uh, insurance. But there were only uh, five lawyers in the entire organization and uh, to train your product teams to understand law was, you know, not not really viable because they'd have to go and do a law degree. Um, mm. And so we had this. So in, in that example, I mean, they were small queries, constant small queries. But every time there was a change, it had to go to the queue of the, the legal department, pull resource. And again, they were doing all sorts of things that weren't necessarily related to that. And I, I tried to embed a lawyer in the product team or at least a slot for a lawyer to exist every sprint to make it happen. Those are the only two levers that I could see to try and get rid of that dependency. And it was like the, it was also like death by a thousand cuts. The, the lag in the product was so immense just because of the single dependency on, 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 on a legal person. So I was just wondering, you know, apart from those two levers of, you know, actually having a dedicated um, lawyer on, on call for that particular work, or at least scheduling time, are there any other patterns that, that can be done to solve that kind of dependency? Interesting question, thank you. I would say that, uh, of course, it's it's hard to advise uh, because the context is always um, uh, important. But I would say that you looked at the uh, most um, impactful tactics uh, because should you in, have the person inside, um, yes, of course, that would be like dependence only between people and roles. However, what I want to say, you mentioned that uh, teaching people would uh, require them uh, uh, learning the other five years or something. Um, I had experiences uh, not with legal, but with uh, compliance. And uh, what we discovered that time, it was uh, one of the small banks in Europe. So what we discovered that uh, out of numerous questions in their case, uh, maybe 80% of uh, questions did not require that much knowledge. So they could learn, not, not tomorrow, not after tomorrow, but maybe within half a year, but they could learn. And uh, we just established that this is a continuous learning because of course, compliance, uh, they, these regulations, they change quite rapidly and they just need to be in the loop. So they involved these guys into those uh, learning sessions when something uh, is released from the government, etc., And they sold this this way. So people learned uh, enough to cover 80%. For other 20, there are, of course, other um, 
something like that. Yeah, scheduling because they know when. Again, this depends on pre predictability. If you know when these people might be needed, then you can secure the time of these people, and uh, you have no this waiting time, right? But again, the, it, it depends. But I'm just uh, suggesting, considering whenever you have uh, the idea that well, that will take uh, that time to um, teach people. Think, do you really need that much to teach about the majority of cases? So that's a, this that's happens. It's a, a really good point. Yeah. And uh, one of the one of the things we try to do to minimize it is that rather than going to legal, we would ask the question: Do we really need to go to legal for this? Was there that much? You know, like if you're making a small change to something, what you know, you took a risk based approach to to whether we would do it or not, and that did make a difference. Um, I. I just wanted to hear from you whether there was a, you know, other pat other patterns. But that seems it seems like a, a logical a logical way forward, is yeah. Not like in compliance, not everything has to go to the compliance officer. People who are working in the domain should understand what that is. It then comes down to um, governance and whether they're allowed to make that decision right or not. But 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 good point. Absolutely, absolutely. I just want to again mention that um, uh, even that. Uh, approach, which is, um, uh, let's take these guys and ensure that they learn uh, for eighty percent of cases in compliance. That is not that simple. Not because of the people. People can learn quite quite well, uh, but the the point is about motivation. <laughs> I'm a developer. Why should I do that? So that comes to um, all the elements of the organizational design. So this is like, uh, what is the role of these people? Is this just coding, or this is the product delivery? Uh, and this is about the um, HR practices, all this stuff. So all these elements should be considered together. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for I was just going to add a quick comment. Uh, Michael, I thought you were talking about the the insurance company I was working with who had a very similar problem, uh, but it was basically one, barely one legal professional available to six teams who were all just cranking out content and it just had a longer and longer blowout in terms of their lead time but um yeah i went to another organization a marketplace one and they seem to have this actually sold to a fair degree they had a legal person dedicated to a, what you probably call a product group it was like just two or three teams and they would just have a quick assessment of upcoming things in backlog refinement and then decide how they would collaborate with the teams in the sprint and it all happens basically synchronously rather than it being all backloaded and having to wait for this legal person to catch up. Yeah, I suggest, uh, normally I suggest not thinking about um, specific roles or people right away, but first think about the capabilities. What kind of capabilities we need here, right? So for instance, uh, speaking about this legal stuff, right? This is not like uh, uh, having a legal person inside. This is about we need to be capable of solving at least 80% of the uh, questions we consider legal re uh, related, right? Maybe we can explore what are those kind of questions. And then that will drive our decision making. Maybe you will find even better approaches. <laughs> All right. Well, Thank the you. Um, Please, yeah. Um, I'm just interested, um, Dennis or, or even Michael and Rowan, you've shared ex experiences. Have you managed to put a dollar figure uh, in terms of what is the cost of having that person embedded or an extra hired person working with that group? And what is the cost of not doing that? And you know the cost of delay heavy or do you know of any research or have you have any direct experience of putting a dollar figure on this to make a case for it? Um, I don't know about that, honestly, but I know why I don't have it. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I don't know, know about public ones. <laughs> so I personally do uh, did, did this. Of course, that was based on the approximations. It's hard to uh, quantify everything. Uh, but that works, of course, uh, much better than just speaking about this. So I agree. The, the concern is quite valid. Um, I know why this is not shared, because the findings that uh, companies have, they don't want to share with their competitors. This is quite impactful. I, I worked with one, uh, not not already started, that there was 200 people in, in the um, fintech company, 
and they discovered uh, an amazing um, uh, approach to organize themselves. And the, the organization inside these kind of uh, uh, companies is approximately uh, the same always. They just copy paste it, you know. So they discovered a much more effective approach. And I said, hey, let's take this to some conference. They said, no, Dennis, forget about this. You have an NDA, right? So shut up. <laughs> because we don't want others to be as well organized as us. That was their approach. That, that was their uh, view on this as a competitive advantage, if you want. So, um, but I always suggest to think money-wise because uh, top management, you need the top management to reorganize, of course. And top management, uh, it's it's hard for, for me, many people to grasp uh, these abstract concepts. We understand it maybe better because we have a little bit different mindset, but they speak money-wise. So if you can put this on money, then of course do it. Uh, be honest with yourself and uh, uh, the um, top managers that this is approximation. Maybe you have a range, but you can quantify it. You have the labor cost, you have uh, uh, the product management who must, if they cannot give you the uh, cost of delay, then what are the <laughs> product managers there? So that can be quantified yeah, and should be probably. Any other questions, guys? So I don't know if you um, um, uh, saw this, but the whole idea of mine, why, why I chose this topic is that, of course, when I see how people work in the organization through all these uh, organizational barriers, um, of course, I see a lot of dependencies, but uh, it's always like, oh my gosh, it's so many. How can I tackle this? It's, 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 it's always and everywhere. But uh, if you at least focus on the most uh, on the highest impact and you solve this, then there are two points. First, it's already good for the company. Second point, it's a huge proof for your approach. So you make a case out of this for your own organization, for the trust of the top management towards you, if you can manage to solve at least this. It's like 80-20, uh, right? You know this Pareto rule that um, in uh, 80 cases, 20% of uh, the problems work. So this is probably even uh, less ratio, right? So uh, bigger difference. In most, um, I would say that the most impact comes exactly from reciprocal interdependencies. But while fixing those, uh, this is another hint, while fixing the in, uh, reciprocal inter interdependencies, you right away fix quite a lot of <laughs> other dependencies. Just because uh, quite many uh, roles, they have uh, simultaneously different types of dependencies with other roles. So fixing just this uh, reciprocal interdependency between two roles, you fix uh, a lot of others. Yeah, that makes, makes a lot of sense. Dennis, thanks for that. Um, I have a question in terms of you, back to your point about providing evidence of the the results of implementing this approach. I'm guessing we could use the most of our agile or not even so agile metrics with lead time, cycle, cycle time, all these kind of things. Do you have preferred uh, metrics that you would be looking into when you are implementing this, uh, this approach with your clients? Well, uh, speaking of metrics, uh, I believe that I had this slide, uh, the blue one with uh, cost, so I try to always put this on something like cost. Where, where is the cost here? Uh, no, 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 no. Even before that. So this, uh, this picture that I showed here. Just give me a second. Yeah, this one. Yeah. So this is uh, something that I would start with. So uh, unless I can put uh, some uh, dollar sign on this, at least that would be something that I, I can speak about because. In my practice, quite often I have uh, product managers or people really accountable for the product success on the very top of, of the hierarchy, and they kind of understand this. So most likely I would expect, expect that these people understand the cost of delay and the cost, cost of work, etc. cetera. Uh, even though that would not have a dollar sign, but still it would uh, raise the awareness and attention to this. Another question that, uh, Nafis, I remember that was yours, right? Uh, you need to always compare, okay, this is the organizational solution, right? 
like hiring another guy who will uh, who will be possessing this necessary uh, um, competence in legal, for example, I don't know, then it will be additional cost. On the other hand, we have these costs, right? So that is quite hard to compare because we don't have a dollar sign on this. Um, however, I, 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 uh, I would say that even in these cases, companies can make this decision. It depends on the um, understanding of uh, and the belief and the mindset of uh, the product uh, management, or at least someone who really cares about product the most and uh, have some experience about product management. Because uh, these metrics are the most uh, common, I would say, in the product management world. And um, one case only when uh, I, I believe that I failed in that was uh, the company that um, it's like a feature factory, you know, so they produced some features for um, uh, their customers. Uh, it, it was um, TNM, so uh, time and material. So they just did not care about that. So they, they just produce something that others uh, request uh, as they request. If it does not bring uh, that much value, if it does not work that's that quick, their customers did not care about that. That was the problem. So for this company that I uh, worked with, the speed of value delivery was not critical. More critical was fulfilling the contract conditions. <laughs> So in this case, uh, this uh, probably is not, not that much in the focus of this kind of company. But if you care about that, then of course, uh, the top management can, even without the dollar sign on this, I, I think that in most cases of mine, yeah, I could, uh, could see the um, appreciation of, of this fact and the uh, understanding of the importance. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know, did I answer the question about the metrics? Some other metrics exist, right? Uh, happiness of the team. Honestly, nobody on the top management cares about that. Yeah, everyone speaks about, yeah, we care about people. We want people to be happy, but that is, well, I, I'm quite straightforward, guys. That is blah, blah. <laughs> nobody really does that much about that. However, I have one amazing experience, guys. You, 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 you will not believe. In one of the companies, I will not disclose this because that is a shame. <laughs> They uh, put so much emphasis on the happiness of people that people got so lazy. <laughs> I mean, I myself felt that, oh my gosh, I, I don't want to work that much because I, I want everyone to be happy here. And they, they just did not really uh, produce anything substantial. So the whole project was closed uh, half a year later. The whole emphasis was just on the happiness of people, in, not in the connection with some achievements of these people. Um, that is not about speed, not about anything. I, I trust that, of course, uh, you probably, well, I don't think about you guys, but some managers think that you can push people more and they will work faster. This is not true because we are speaking about uh, mostly uh, creative work. You cannot push for the creative work results with value in the um, as a critical aspect. So there are many uh, discussions around that. Uh, do we need exactly the speed of value delivery, but that is a quite separate topic. Yeah, so th thanks heaps. We're now at 12 past nine now. Uh, oh, um, Ron, well, I got two very final questions. Question. Yeah. Um, first, what's the, um, what's that green logo, the circle DAO logo? Is that a, a thing, a company? Um, ex excuse me, can, can you repeat? I did not hear it. There's a little um, logo, well, a big logo, the green one with DAO in the middle on various slides, mainly towards the end, the designing ah, yeah, the, the, the logo. DAO, this is the logo of the course uh, that uh, I'm offering. Uh, okay, in, cool. That's, um... in August. Yeah. This, this logo, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, DAO stands for the Designing Agile Organizations. So that's, uh, the, that's, course... that's you, as it were. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So these, yeah. these guidelines are taken exactly from that course. There are Okay. Uh, different guidelines, the whole approach to designing agile organizations, etc. So that is uh, something that I can tell you um, when when you can manage to yeah. get the top management to discuss this, uh, 
Mm. Uh, that is much simpler to speak to them because you're speaking not about frameworks. You're not speaking about some abstract stuff that mm. they don't understand. You're speaking about risks. You're speaking about strategy. You're speaking about what holds them back from the strategy, what capabilities, organizational capabilities are needed to actually achieve what you need uh, in terms of these strategic goals. And from there, you go um, below and beyond the framework. So this is this is not about frameworks. You can look at this at... Also, it can help you if you have a framework, mm. you don't know how to fill those intentional gaps, for example. I don't like this approach because you already have something pre-installed, probably mm. not optimal way. And moreover, you will have uh, the outer organization, right? This surrounding organization, which will hit you and drive your people in other directions. But still, uh, the approach that is given here is based on the optimization goals. This concept is, is huge. So it's like uh, you can always say that, yeah, I optimize my organization to achieve my strategic goals. That is cool. But your organization is what you manage. Your strategic goals depend not only on your organizational capabilities, but also on the market, on other competitors, on all the stuff outside the organization. So if you, for instance, measure the um, success in terms of uh, how optimal is your organization uh, designed, just solely based on the uh, goals achievement, that might be misleading because you sometimes achieve the goals despite mm -hmm. shitty organization. I have this experience, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. but sometimes vice versa. So this is why you need the optimization goals mm -hmm. based on the capabilities. For example, adaptability. Yeah, Speaking about agile organizations, adaptability is a, a conceptually underlying topic. So you need... Uh, people to be adaptable, to tackle, and to um, absorb uh, variability, for example, right? Mm. For example, variability in terms of the tasks, variability in terms of those uh, business demands, variability in terms of even the work to be done. Right now, you need more on the side of testing. In the next sprint, you need more on the side of development. While test, uh, testing people are only doing testing and developers are doing only developers, what are we speaking about here? We just re recently discussed how to teach people uh, legal stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in some companies, people say, well, no, 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 no. This is not, I'm, I'm a developer. You see here, my job description, <laughs> it is said. And here are the HR people. And here is my manager who asks me for my individual achievements in mm -hmm. terms of coding. So that is everything incorporated. So um, you can, of course, um, apply this knowledge from this course to some specific aspects inside the framework. But I would say that even choosing the framework or even inventing your own framework, which is not the framework, that, but the holistic organizational design. You saw, I showed you not the teams, I showed you the departments, marketing and hmm. teams and technology and support and everything. And you consider this from the perspective, what is needed for the company, not for those managers who need to uh, develop their careers in their chairs, but for the top management. So this is why this topic uh, requires you really understand that only the top management can make the most difference. Yet you can, of course, uh, do some little difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> However, if you, if you want the maximum effect, of course, you need to redesign um, quite a lot in the organization and adjust different aspects like those HR mm -hmm. practices, for example, line management, et cetera. Yeah. Um, yeah. A Sorry. second question, but this should be a quick one on those list of four books. Um, if, I, yeah, yeah. if you're going to yeah. buy one, Coming which one? To it. Uh, I don't read more than a couple of books a year, so I'm not buying them all. Yeah, one okay. So um, the course that we're <laughs> speaking about, you, you can skip going to the course, guys. Yeah. If you yeah. read the book on the right here, the Creating Agile Organization, because okay. this book cool. is the, the foundation. However, just a warning, because this is the first edition and it is a little bit, you know, um, uh, hard to read. Not that hard uh, compared to axiomatic design, honestly, <laughs> but still. And uh, what uh, happened uh, since the book was uh, released of course, a lot of learning by ourselves. I mean, the trainers, mm. we enriched uh, the course. I would say the 50, maybe 50% 50 of the course is something new that you will not find in the book. And of course, the understanding of all this concept that you can find in the book, but still the book is very, very valuable, of course. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, this book is based on other books here. Okay, but this is not the uh, comprehensive list. The, there are much, much, much more books. If you want to pick one, then the uh, creating agile organizations. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I've only read a couple of these books, but that's the one I'd start with. Okay, and, I'm finishing um, off my yeah. book first, but <laughs> nice, nice one. Yes, okay, look, guys. Um, thank you so much to Dennis. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thanks.